My name is John V. Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Greg Prechtel. He is a native of Dunkirk, New York, and did his undergraduate and master's work in English at Fredonia. Subsequently, he had a year of additional graduate work at Oklahoma prior to being called back to fill a coaching position at Fredonia during the 72-73 academic year, and he has been at Fredonia ever since. Greg currently serves as athletic director at Fredonia and director of the Boys and Girls Club at Chautauqua Institution. Greg, what are your primary responsibilities as AD at Fredonia? As AD at Fredonia? Correct. Uh, at, at Fredonia, I oversee uh, the, the recreation and, and intercollegiate athletic program. I uh, am responsible for uh, overseeing compliance for all our Division Three athletes. We have about 350 athletes at Fredonia. We offer 19 sports from uh, from men's soccer to uh, women's lacrosse to uh, cheerleading and volleyball. Uh, our, uh, my department is responsible for uh, uh, the bus contract or the bus bid, for uh, purchasing uh, uniforms, practice gear, uh, equipment, for uh, arranging officials for home uh, events, uh, pretty much anything that you would anticipate would go along with the intercollegiate athletic program or with a intramural and recreation program. Right. Now, can you tell me what are um, what division does Fredonia compete in? Yeah, we are Division Three. We're the largest division of the NCAA. There are about uh, 435 or 440 Division Three schools. Uh, schools like uh, SUNY Fredonia, SUNY Geneseo, uh, Oneonta, and New Paltz. Schools like St. John Fisher, University of Rochester, Emory University, uh, St. Uh, uh, WashU, and St. Louis. It, it's a wide uh, range of public and private schools. Okay. Now, are there any implications of competing at Division Three, such as scholarship support or, or financing or the like? Yeah. Uh, Division Three aid cannot be uh, awarded based on athletic ability. Uh, and. and that uh, people don't understand that, but uh, I think uh, everybody has been to a high school basketball or football game, and everybody knows that there are there are a lot of uh, young men and women that play uh, high school sports, and very few of them end up getting a uh, scholarship, a full ride to a University of Georgia or a Notre Dame or a North Carolina or an Indiana. So uh, the rest of those uh, quality players are uh, they're available to be recruited by coaches at at uh, you know Division three schools. Uh, we're all pursuing those kids that just uh, maybe we're a little too short to play at, at a Division one basketball school or just a half a step slow, uh, not not quick enough to play in the backfield at a uh, Notre Dame, but still are kids that could help our program. So. We try to identify those uh, those young people. Uh, you know, try to uh, go and see them in the field. Uh, try to get them to visit our school and uh, e encourage them to apply, and uh, you know, try to convince them that uh, we're the right place for them from uh, from an athletic program and from an academic uh, from the academic offerings we have. Right now, what major areas do your coaches do their recruiting? What I'm where, sorry, do, where do you recruit students typically for Fredonia? Uh, well, Fredonia is pretty much, since we're tucked away in the uh, corner of uh, New York State, we're in the westernmost uh, campus of, of uh, the state. We tend to recruit to the east. Uh, primarily, our, our recruiting area is uh, Syracuse, uh, Syracuse and West. Although I think I mentioned to you uh, earlier that uh, when I first started coaching, I, uh, I was recruiting out in Kansas. Uh, we had a lot of young men from the New York City area that played, uh, graduated high school, got recruited out to the Jayhawk Conference uh, to play basketball out there, a high level basketball. And then maybe we're looking to come back home after two years out in Kansas. Uh, so we had a, a number of players from uh, Maryland, Kansas, and Pennsylvania in my first years of coaching basketball. Then we moved to Long Island. That became a hotbed, uh, a lot of talented players down there. Eventually we got into Western Pennsylvania. And so you just kind of go where the, uh, where the talent is. Where the flow is also, yeah. okay. Now you, you indicated that most of your opponents, and it sounded like our tend to be in state colleges in New York State. And I remember University of Rochester was in the list you mentioned there. Yeah. Are there any great rivalries? Like like Michigan Ohio State. Uh, well, on a much smaller uh, level. All right, we have a we have a rivalry series with uh, Buffalo State University. All right, uh, they're just 40, uh, 40 miles up the road. Uh, we've got a, a cup that passes back and forth depending on which team uh, was most successful in uh, in the sports we compete in, and we compete in uh, I think uh, fourteen uh, fourteen or sixteen sports. Uh, SUNY Geneseo has been a, a, a big uh, competitor for us or, or a big rival. Uh, then on the non-league side, I would say St. John Fisher, we uh, knock heads with some. Uh, yeah, we do play, uh, our non-league schedule includes 
uh, you know, University of Rochester, RIT, uh, you know, uh, schools, again, uh, you know, from private schools that are, are easy enough for us to get to and uh, are not cost prohibitive. So the transportation is doable. Also, that means alumni have a chance of coming to see a game easily, yeah. don't they? Yeah, my, if, if most of our, our uh, athletes are from Syracuse West, uh, it's nice if we can schedule games that mom and dad can get to. Great. And so that, that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it. But, but I, I would say a lot, of our, a lot of our coaches also try to uh, schedule a uh, trip. Our swim team takes a 12-day trip to Florida uh, between uh, you know, uh, Christmas and, and the start of the second semester. When I first started coaching, we always took a trip to New Orleans or to uh, Florida. Uh, we played some big-time programs back then. I mentioned that we had played Purdue, Virginia Tech, South Carolina. Those, but those days are, are uh, kind of gone now. Okay. Let me ask you about this trophy with Buffalo State. Yeah. Who currently holds it? Uh, we do. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. How yeah. long have we held it? Proud of that. Well, uh, this is uh, just the inaugural year, so okay. we, we were happy to to uh, bring the trophy home to our place. That's and you give your give your athletes. Yeah. Challenging. This isn't going to the Steel City. This yeah. is staying in Fredonia. Yeah, you yeah. better make that happen. In Buffalo State's, uh, yeah, they're pretty good in some programs. So yeah, it's. Uh, I'm proud of what our kids have done. Good, good. Um, let me ask a question. A little different gear here. And we've read a great deal um, in the literature about traumatic brain injuries among professional athletes mm -hmm. lately. Could you just take a few minutes and, and really give us a good explanation of what's going on? We know for many of them, they're they're. Stuff started in college. Yeah. I think probably tell us what sports you play that or don't play that would be high, at high risk. Well, uh, collision sports are the sports where you tend to have uh, more uh, head head trauma injuries. So uh, ice hockey is is uh, a sport. Uh, football, uh, soccer, somewhat. Uh, we don't play men's lacrosse, but I would assume men's lacrosse. We have women's lacrosse. So uh, the NCAA mandated uh, after uh, you know after a lot of uh, study uh, like the. Uh, like the NFL, uh, nobody moves forward uh, terribly aggressively until uh, you know there are there are the issue is brought to the forefront and people are, are uh, you know jumping up and down saying it has to be addressed. But the NCAA, to their credit, did uh, mandate that all uh, that all uh, athletes at the collegiate level uh, who suffer a uh, brain trauma injury or get concussed or have their bell rung, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that they have to uh, set out, uh, that they have to be tested. We do baseline testing on all our athletes now. I think that's that's uh, mandatory. So you have a baseline. Then the uh, when a, a, a trainer a trainer is at every event at all our uh, at all our athletic events. If uh, somebody uh, somebody gets wobbly or somebody, it's obvious that they've clanked heads with somebody. Uh, the trainer, uh, the, the student athlete has to come off, the trainer has to evaluate them. Uh, that young person is held out of the contest or out of the game for the rest of the game. And then they have to, there's a wait period before uh, they, can be, uh, they can be evaluated again and, and uh, play hugely uh, like a week. So that's real serious business then, isn't it? And it, it is. Yeah, well it done. is. And no one wants to, you know, no one wants to uh, sacrifice somebody's health for, uh, for, you know, the success of maybe uh, winning a game. It's right. Just not a let me let me pin you down. Is does Fredonia <laughs> play football? We do not. All right. And uh, football is an extremely expensive sport. Okay. We do not have a phys ed major at Fredonia. Uh, SUNY has uh, Brockport uh, State, uh, Cortland State, and Buffalo State all have football uh, programs. There are 10 teams in our conference. Three of those schools field football teams. Okay. I have always said, even though people would like to have a football program, uh, if you can't be successful, uh, there's no sense in fielding a team. And we don't have the resources right now. I would not want to allocate the kind of money it would take uh, to uh, start a football program. Uh, travel is always, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, two buses, it's uh, an immense amount of equipment. Uh, there's a coaching staff that has to number uh, six or eight for one sport. Uh, it just, it would eat up all our uh, resources and we would have to drop uh, some other sports. So, so that settles it. Yeah, yeah that, as that, far as I'm concerned, and I, you know, I, I don't see it that changing anytime. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good decision. Well, and, thank you. And um, as, as we put in the byline, I, I had the faculty position at Campbell in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They started playing football, and I, I have some mixed feelings about it. Uh -huh. And, and um, well, football at the big schools. I mean, it's a money generator. It's great for the uh, uh, alumni base. It's, I mean, it rallies the community. But uh, 
Wow, it, it is, uh, yeah, there are a lot of problems that come along with uh, big-time football. As well. And we have a non-scholarship uh, yeah. program, yeah. and so if we're playing a scholarship Tough team, to compete. We, get, we get beat up, yeah. and if it's a non-scholarship team, then we can be, and it's an academically oriented university, yeah. those two, sure. then we can compete. So, yeah. for example, Davidson is good competition for yeah. us. Yeah. Patriot League, other, I would think, would be, uh, those schools would be good competition yeah. for the Bucknells and the Lehigh's. And uh, yeah, the yeah. I don't know if they're scholarship or not, but the same, yeah. same sort of focus to them. Yeah, our basketball team played uh, Davidson just three years ago. I they did. Yeah, yeah. And how do they do? Uh, well, they lost, but they. Okay. Uh, but they're again. Uh, you know, Davidson's a little higher, higher profile. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. So. And and a uh, a good one. Yeah. Okay. Now we've been. Um, you typically have uh, about um, 300, 350 students you have to keep track of. That's correct. And you have to look at their academics and what else? Yeah, uh, every, we have uh, we have department uh, departmental uh, regulations that, that, that govern uh, whether a student athlete is eligible. We have uh, university regulations and the NCAA has regulations. So we have to we have to ensure that they're full-time students, that they're uh, progressing towards their degree uh, as the rest of the student body is. And I would say at most Division three schools, Fredonia is the same, our, our student athletes graduate at a uh, about an eight percent higher rate than the general student body. Will you, will you repeat that again? Yeah, well, that's that's the truth, and that you know, Fredonia is not a lot different than a lot of other Division three schools. Uh, student athletes tend to graduate at a higher rate, and at Fredonia, it's about eight uh, eight to ten percent higher than the normal student body, and a lot of that has to do with. There is someone who, they, they're part of a team, uh, you know, they don't want to let their teammates down. There's a coach that's checking on them. Uh, you know, the, the uh, athletic department is checking to see that, hey, if they, we, we get a copy of their midterm grades, if, uh, if their midterm grades are not where we think they should be, they're, they're called in and asked what the problem is and told that, uh, hey, if they want to be eligible, they've got, to, you know, they've got to buck up and get this taken care of. So I think there's just a little more, there's a little more uh, oversight or, or uh, shepherding uh, right. the kids along the way. Right. I, I recognize that as an Army or OTC cadet. Mm -hmm. Much closer control watching, mm -hmm. and um, I, I can relate to it very closely. I hadn't realized the athletes have a higher graduation rate. This is at the Division three level. And, and Division one has, uh, they have uh, normal progress rates they have to make. If they don't, uh, the, the school loses scholarships. Uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, at the Division One level, there's a lot more tutoring that takes place. We don't have a great tutorial uh, program, but we do keep track of kids. And, uh, you know, uh, the other the other thing I would say is sometimes even though it's uh, somewhat annoying and I'm not able to get some kids in that uh, we identify as being good athletes that could do very well in our athletic teams, the uh, admissions office is a gatekeeper, and they sometimes will not allow those marginal students to come in. So we're starting with a, a pretty good, uh, you know, a pretty good base. And that's that's... that's Clearly within the purpose of the university. Yes. Now let's switch gears a little bit. You grew up in Fredonia, Dunkirk. You went to college in Fredonia. Yeah. How did you get to Chautauqua? Ah, got to Chautauqua. My uh, first uh, visit to Chautauqua, I think I mentioned, it's when they used to, they, uh, they had, uh, I guess it was uh, vertical parking or diagonal parking out along the fence on okay. uh, 394. Uh, right. Uh, me and my high school buddy, are, uh, you know, we used to drive over here uh, and climb over the fence and go down to the uh, pier building for dances on, <laughs> on Friday night uh, okay. during the summer. But uh, my travels to uh, Chautauqua, or my, my employment at Chautauqua started, uh, I was, part of my responsibility at, at uh, SUNY Fredonia was uh, I had summer responsibilities. Uh, the state had a New York State Summer School of the Art program for young people that were talented, high school kids that were talented in the visual arts and the performing arts. And that program was housed at Fredonia. So those young people came from across the state to a, a, a six-week program at uh, SUNY Fredonia. And uh, four times during, that, uh, during the summer, uh, we would take the, uh, the youngsters over to uh, Chautauqua. But at the uh, start of that program, once uh, the kids were dropped off by their parents and uh, there was an opening meeting where Jim Ridlon, who was the artistic director, a former football player at uh, Syracuse and played uh, in the NFL for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Jim would talk about what the kids were going to uh, experience in the classroom. I would talk about, I was, my, uh, my uh, title was head counselor, I would talk to the uh, young people about what the expectations were when they were in the dorm, what we were going to do uh, when they were out of class, uh, where we were going to travel. We'd take them to Niagara Falls. Uh, we'd take them to Panama Rocks. We'd bring them over to Chautauqua just to fill out their uh, mm -hmm. weekend days. And uh, I got to know Dick Reddington also was a vice president here. And, and Dick uh, did a presentation at that meeting uh, where he talked about what the uh, young people would experience when they came to Chautauqua. 
and Dick and I got to know each other. I think I mentioned uh, Dick approached me uh, and asked me, he had an opening uh, at the Boys and Girls Club, asked me if I would be interested in, in looking at the, uh, the directorship. And I talked it over with my wife, Linda. Uh, she was pregnant with our third child. Uh, it just the timing wasn't, uh, wasn't right. So I, I said I appreciated Dick and uh, it just, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not able to take the job. Well, as uh, luck would have it, uh, uh, the job was filled uh, for a three-year period. Uh, uh, Charlie, I can't think of Charlie's last name, was here uh, uh, and uh, did a nice job, but he, he was moving on. Uh, it ties up your summer, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dick came back to me and asked me again if I would come over and take a look at the program, and uh, I did. Uh, he offered me the job, and uh, I just am in my 29th uh, summer at Chautauqua. Your 29th summer? Yes. Now, what are your responsibilities at the club? And I will say this. I thank Dick Reddington every time I see him for, I would. for giving me that opportunity. I, would. So, I haven't seen him recently. Uh, I saw him just the other day at a concert, and uh, That's he's, great. he's a good man. That's great. Yeah. So tell us what you do at club. Uh, well, at club, I, I'm the director. I work with a team. And let's take a look here. Okay. Uh, I'm, I work with a team of adults. Uh, this is the Beeson Youth Center. This is where we have our administrative offices. Uh, the nurse's station is there. Our arts and crafts program is housed in the Beeson Youth Center. Uh, that was a gift of uh, the Beeson family when uh, Dave and, and uh, Denny's mom and dad passed in an uh, airplane accident. Great. Girls Club is one of the prettiest buildings on the grounds. Uh, that's where we have our morning assemblies uh, with the youngest kids. Boys Club is a gym type setting. Uh, most of the children at uh, Boys and Girls Club, and we have this week, we are just under 400. We're averaging about 430 uh, children uh, per day uh, through the first uh, five weeks of the summer. Most of, most of the kids either walk or bike down to club. Yeah, there's a, a ton of bikes. This is right after uh, afternoon announcements and the, uh, and the uh, children are walking out of uh, the Girls Club down towards the waterfront. Uh, we give swim lessons, we have recreational swim, we do boating and kayaking, and uh, so a lot of our activities take place. The kids are on or in the water twice a day. Uh, and this is instruction being uh, given by the, uh, by the swim counselor. Uh, we have uh, 11 certified lifeguards that work during the summer. Uh, Chuck Bauer is our aquatics director. Chuck's been with me, for, I think, for 22 or 20, uh, 23 years. Again, I, I was laughing because this, uh, this video shows there are no reluctant participants. So there's one checking the water out before she went in. But she got in. Yeah, they are. Uh, sometimes on the colder days, especially in the morning at 9 or 9.30 in the morning when it, uh, there's a chill in the air, it's a little harder to get the, uh, the youngsters into the water for their swim lesson. But uh, these kids, it must have been a pretty nice day and they seem to be pretty eager to get in there. This is just a recreational swim. Again, uh, this is just to acclimate the kids to most of the kids are pool swimmers, but uh, since we're in a lakefront setting, it's important the kids uh, learn to be comfortable in, in the lake. These are our two canoes. Uh, we have canoeing for all the kids at club. Uh, the youngest kids, uh, who are these are young, uh, young people either going into first or second grade. We have uh, two large canoes uh, tethered together so they're much more stable and the kids don't have to worry about, uh, about falling out or, or getting nervous because there's a lot of uh, instability. Uh, we have, uh, again, two, uh, two waterfront counselors, uh, one in each end of the boat, and then a, a group counselor there. Uh, kayaks were introduced to club uh, about uh, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, Jack Volker, who was uh, the, the person I reported to, a great guy, uh, one of the best, uh, one of my, the best people I've ever worked with, uh, Jack was instrumental in getting kayaks to club. We have an arts and crafts program, we have uh, nature, we have music, we teach tennis, uh, sailing is taught at club. So it's a nice broad range of uh, activities that take place at club. This, I believe, it looks like they're cheering or doing some crazy exercises, but I, they might have been uh, getting ready for an air band, part of an air band uh, competition, I'm not sure. But these are older girls, probably uh, eighth graders or so, uh, freshmen in high school. Mm -hmm. Field games take place, uh, capture the flag, and uh, you know manhunt and that sort of thing. Uh, Sharp Field is one of the uh, one of the areas that we have. Uh, uh, softball, baseball used to be played there. Now uh, there's a softball league in the evening. Kids play kickball. Uh, Bennis is baseball played with the tennis racket. Uh, you know they, the kids come up with crazy games. Uh, they're very enjoyable. Uh, this is uh, Air Band. Uh, Air Band takes place uh, on the th uh, Thursday before the old, uh, old first night. So this is uh, every group uh, gets together. They decide on a medley of songs. 
Uh, it's a lip sync contest. The kids get kind of these. Now these must be about seventh grade boys, I would guess, from the way they're behaving. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the kids. Uh, there's music played. Uh, each group goes on the amphitheater stage. It's a it's a hoop for the parents and the uh, grandparents. It's kind of a neat opportunity for the kids to be up there in front of an audience. It's also we use it as a fundraiser for our contribution to the Chautauqua Fund. I think we made uh, just under three thousand dollars this year. Wonderful uh, on, on the performance. Yeah. Wonderful. And the kids have lots of fun, don't they? They do. They do. It involves a lot of work uh, by the uh, counselors, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good time for the kids and the counselors. I want to come back to that, but let me ask a couple more things. We saw a whole lot of activities that are performed there. How do you select those activities? <coughs> well, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the activities have traditionally been offered at club. Mm -hmm. uh, again, since we're on the water, uh, it's uh, you know it's important that the kids learn to be comfortable on the water. I think uh, summer uh, we've got uh, 400 or 450 children there. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of play space. We're blessed with a really nice uh, campus for our facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to teach lifetime skills, all right, like uh, tennis and sailing, all right. It's important that they learn to swim. Uh, we want kids to be involved in activities that uh, you know that give them an opportunity to run and jump and, and uh, work on aerobic conditioning. We also having uh, we have enriching programs. Uh, we have speakers from uh, you know that, that maybe are at uh, Chautauqua uh, come down and talk to our older kids. We've had people from NASA. We've had professional athletes. Jackie Robinson's daughter. I mean, just a, a, a wide variety of people. Right. Now you gave me a terrific number for counselors. I didn't think it was that high. How do you select these young folks, and how do you train them? Yeah, uh, well, uh, there's an application process people have to go through. Uh, right after the first of the year, uh, people are asked to go online, uh, young people. Mm -hmm. it, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, counselors are, are uh, young people who have come through the program. Uh, our program runs through their, the end of their sophomore year in high school. Then uh, when they are going into their junior year, they're no longer, we no longer have uh, campers at that age. So. Mm -hmm. We do have a CIT program, so anybody what does that stand for? Uh, counselor in training. Okay. So any young person who is no longer eligible to come to club because uh, of their age, uh, they can apply for a CIT position. Unfortunately, we have many more applicants than we have spots available, and that's kind of traumatic for uh, for some of the kids who've been coming to uh, to club oh, yeah. since they were six years old. Uh, but. I rely a lot on uh, on what I see. We take uh, a, a, we take a canoe trip down the Allegheny River with the older kids. Uh, we have the air band competition. We have a water Olympics uh, during the summer. There are track and field days. So there are opportunities for some of these young people to either sh either shine athletically or to show leadership uh, qualities or to show that they're uh, you know that they're they're good colleagues with the other kids in their group. Uh, so uh, the younger kids uh, apply for a CIT position. Uh, other, uh, we, we hire regional kids. We hire uh, you know siblings of, uh, of young people who have worked for us in the past. But yeah, I, I have a staff of uh, just under 90, and uh, about 75 of those uh, people are, are high school and college age students. Okay. Is, there a, is there a train up for them? There is. Uh, so anyhow, there's an interview process. I interview everyone that's, uh, that I employ. Uh, they have to provide references. I do reference checks on, on anyone that I don't know. Uh, actually, I do reference checks on everybody. And then uh, we have a orientation, uh, a three-day orientation prior to mm -hmm. the start of the season. And with these kids coming, many of them coming through the program, they have some idea of what's expected. Exactly. And that's yeah, it. And, and, uh, yeah, and the, the nice thing is they're from all over the country. We have, we have uh, people on staff from uh, California, from Georgia, from Florida, from Pennsylvania, from New England, uh, you know, and uh, we have international, uh, you know, kids whose parents are, are uh, you know, uh, in business overseas and yeah. uh, they're here for the summer. And I was impressed when I was down there just watching the counselors make interventions and they were, they were quick and they were, they were at it, but they weren't unreasonable mm -hmm. and, and I watched lots of kids there, and I only saw one who didn't seem to be responsive. Yeah. And there was no giving up on him. It's kind yeah. of like we're going to find what the key is, yeah. and you're you're going to uh, yeah. you're going to come around. The counseling staff is is very talented. Yeah. Uh, but they also are young people, and and uh, you know I, we do. I'm just, I'm saying I, this is kind of a trend. You see, weeks one through five, uh, everybody is up and doing their job, and you know they're they're at the top of their game. As the summer drags on a little bit, I've got to be a little more, uh, be out there and, and making sure that kids aren't staying out too late and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, a little tired. And uh, But but for the most part, uh, we're very blessed with the counseling right. staff. Yeah. Can you tell me, uh, in, our, in our final minutes here, mm -hmm. how the uh, camping experience has changed over the years? 
at, at Boys and Girls Club? Got it. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, when I started almost 30 years ago, uh, the, the, I think it was like about 72% of the campers were month-long or longer uh, students or, or mm -hmm. participants. Their, their family came here, they uh, owned houses on the grounds, or they came to vacation, uh, but they were here for a month or some of them for the season. Mm -hmm. uh, that dynamic has changed uh, significantly. And uh, you know, it's now to a point where we're almost 80% are two weeks or less. So we've got uh, young people who are, it's, uh, you've got less time to learn a young person's name, to learn what he or she likes, uh, to learn what makes him, uh, what motivates uh, him or her. Uh, there's a little less knowledge of some of the traditions of Chautauqua, uh, like Old First Night or, mm -hmm. or that. But uh, hey, kids are kids. Uh, it, you know, it's just a little bit more of a challenge uh, for the counselors, but uh, I, w they do a nice job, and, and uh, we're happy to have. We had about uh, just under 1,500 different children at Boys and Girls Club last summer. Right, right. Do you see any any predictions, or can you make any predictions in the future as to how this this club will change in our closing moment here? Yeah. I, I know there's a lot more use of technology. I mean, uh, it's, it's harder now. Kids used to, uh, yeah, we try to tell kids, hey, your cell phones, leave your cell phones at the door, okay? Turn your cell phones off. You're here to interact with your counselors who can give you great advice and who are great role models. You're here to interact with the young person to the right and left of you who are from you know, other parts of the country. Uh, there's a temptation for kids to always be checking their cell phones, and that's something that, uh, hey, that's something that uh, shouldn't happen at, uh, at uh, summer camp. I think that's a wonderful thing. I sort of in retrospect, having spent an hour or so down there with a camera, I didn't see anybody checking the yeah. cell phones, yeah. and, and I think that's absolutely wonderful, saying yeah. interact with others, play some sports, yeah. and... and uh, Take advantage of the things that we offer absolutely. at Chautauqua Institution. Absolutely. Yeah. That's terrific. This has been great fun. All right, John. And talking with you on Chautauqua people, Thank and do come much. back. All right. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. Thank you.